Well, good morning today. We're so glad you could be here. Oh, I got one excited face right here. How about you other people? Y'all excited to be in the house of the Lord? Well, good. Well, we're so excited you could be here. Welcome to Family Worship Center. Uh, we want to say welcome to Pastor Brandon and Delaney Woodward from Copper Point, our special guest today. You guys are going to be blessed by them. This guy is incredible at speaking, and only she's just more incredible, right? Of course. He's shaking his head very fast, but you guys step across the aisle, find a face that you don't know, give him a handshake, high five, let's meet some people today.
will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk above the waters wherever you may call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk above. up with you. He'll, he'll have communion with you. And then we hear the one scripture that he is, you know, we hear about that he is omnipresent, that he's everywhere in this place, that he's, where can you go? Uh, David even said, where can I go that you are not there? You know, there's no place that you can go, you know, maybe there's, there's, I don't know. It's just kind of hard to fathom. And then we hear pastors sometimes say, we invite you into this place. He's here. The place that he wants to get into is right here. He wants, to ex he wants you to experience the fullness of who he is. He wants you to experience all the blessings that he has for you. And it's kind of like, you know, being married, sometimes we get so much in a routine that, you know, I look at Trisha and I'm going, Trisha, it's starting to feel like we're just roommates. It's starting to, we just, we just come home, get the kids ready. We do what we need to do uh, for bed. We wake up, we go and do, we have almost our own agendas, yet it's still combined because we have kids. Right? You can be in the same place as the Holy Spirit, and he has so much in store for you today, but I've got this going on, and I can't really focus on what you want me to do, God, because I've got to be there at this time, because I've got this meeting, I've got this to do, this is, oh, I've got this phone call to make. I don't want to be a roommate with the Holy Spirit. I want him to inhabit me. I want him to come into my life and do the work that he needs to do because you know what that scripture that says be holy for I am holy that's a hard thing to do so then there's this Jesus that came and died on the cross and bridged the gap and then now I have holiness and righteousness in me not by my own measure because if like Paul said it's like filthy rags any righteousness that I have but he has come to do a great work in my life so what I would tell you this morning don't be the Holy Spirit's roommate. Don't be just God's roommate. Experience the blessings that he has for you. Experience him today. And you know what? If you realize today that you're checking yourself right now and you're realizing, I'm, we're really just roommates right now, you tell him, 
Let me experience you today. Let me experience you. Sing this with me. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your the need of your Holy Spirit to direct our lives and let us walk in truth. Come in like a flood. Come and do the work that you need to do in our individual lives. Let us experience you this morning. Let us put away all agendas that interfere with our appointment with you this morning. Lord, that we could focus on you and realize that you love us and you are here to meet our needs you're here to make us stronger you're here to heal us you're here to give us peace and joy and we glorify you we glorify you Amen. before you're seated you say, say, he inhabits me. We've been in, we've really been in about a, a three-month series of some absolutely incredible teaching, just really talking about how we can be the people that God has created us to be. And um, Angie, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell your story uh, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, I told you I told you the story about uh, Tabitha uh, Sherman was telling us about how she uh, became a priest and was setting up a tent, a meeting for uh, people to 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 meet God. And it's really our motto. It's who we are as a church. We're being the church outside of the four walls of the church. Angie called me Friday. She was talking so fast my ears almost could not keep up with her. And uh, she was wound up tighter than Dick's hat band. She was just, she was rolling and rolling. And as I got to listen to her, I got to hear the excitement in her voice. But before this, she had an encounter, a meeting with a lady. Before this meeting was over with, she really got to share Jesus with this lady. She got to pray with her over a need that they were discussing in her life. And then after that, Angie asked her if she had ever accepted the Lord into her life. She kind of gave her a little bit of her history. And Angie got to pray the sinner's prayer with this lady. Is that not, is that not the absolute? Hey, we're a priest. That's who God has called us to be. We're setting up a, a tent. We're setting up a place for God and man to meet. We're taking the church outside of the four walls of the church, and we're becoming the people that God has asked us to be, wants us to be, and created us to be. And I'm excited to be right in the middle of that. Amen? Well, man, we came off these incredible series, and we've been talking about who am I 
And uh, really, who God has created us to be, we rolled right into simply Jesus, talking about the miracles of Jesus. But we went underneath the miracles. We looked way below the miracle and actually looked at the story or, or really what God is wanting to teach us uh, in, in those miracles. And man, the answer to all of our problems is walking in his anointing, walking in his power. The answer to our problems is simply Jesus. Well, we know that we, we get things that we struggle, things that we face all the time in our lives. And so we're going to come in this next month, starting today, my nephew Brandon from the great church, Copper Point Church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Brandon's going to come and speak today. And we're going to kick off today. We're going to be really going for the next few weeks talking about toxic. And there are toxic relationships. There's toxic thoughts. There's toxic influences. There's all these different things that we can have in our life that becomes very toxic in our Christian walk. And it's things that literally make us not just mentally sick or physically sick, but it makes us spiritually ill. And so we're going to look at these toxins. But today, Brandon, I'm going to ask Brandon to come up. Uh, I tell you, I got good-looking nephews. That's all I know. I'm going to ask Brandon. Uh, he's going to come up. He's going to be kicking this off today. Brandon, I am proud of you. you. I always want you to know that. Man, Brandon is, uh, Brandon is an incredible guy. I, I got to let the cat out of the hat, uh, out of the bag, because I always have to say something that you probably don't like. I always have to do this. But um, when Brandon was playing football as a little bitty kid, I honestly believe his helmet was bigger than him. I don't know if you remember these days, and I'd go yeah, out and I watch. Remember. I'd go out and watch him play football, and my dad nicknamed him Mouse because he was so fast, <laughs> and because that helmet was so big on his head. And so I'm not going to call you Pastor Mouse today, but I just had to tell that story. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm here for you. Thank you, you for man. setting me up to win. I, I really <laughs> appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Delaney, would you stand? Uh, Delaney, is, this is this better half. Delaney, it's so good to have you here. We are excited for the word that you're about to bring. Welcome one more time, Brandon Woodward. Thank you, Ronnie. All right. Would you uh, look at somebody next to you and just say, I'm glad to be here today? Would you do that for me? You are so glad. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, well, hey, I'm, I'm glad to be here as well, uh, Ronnie, with Kane and everything. That suits you well. I think that just needs to be the new thing that you do. If when I'm back here in a few months or in a year, so I want you to preach with that. You can point at people. It'd be great. Um, well, hey, uh, like Ronnie said, I don't have to give too much of an introduction. My name is Brandon. Uh, I'm 26 years old, and I am the youngest son of Ronnie's older brother, Galen. Um, and so I've, I've spent a lot of time in Amarillo. My grandma lives here. Grandma Jerry, can you wave real quick? That's grandma. That's the best grandma on the planet right there. You're looking at her. Uh, but we got to stay with her last night, and it's been too long since I got to do that, so I'm, I'm glad I got to do that. Thank you, Ronnie, so much for letting me come out here, and uh, I'm, I just feel very blessed to be here. Um, I, I think that this is, this, these are pastors right here, Pastor Ronnie and Pastor Shannon, that are, are tired of, of, of dull church. They're tired of it being religion. They're tired of it being dead, and, and I love that there's a group of people here in Amarillo that are, are going to jump on board with that vision and move this thing forward, and so could you guys give Pastor Ronnie and Pastor Shannon the big hand? I know, uh, I feel like it's like the guest speaker thing to do, to be like, yeah, I got to talk about the senior pastors, but I'm, I mean it. I mean, even if you weren't my uncle and my aunt, um, I would still be saying these things about you guys. You guys are amazing, and I love what you're doing here, and I'm so happy to be here, Ronnie. Thank you. We've been trying to work this out for like a year, and, uh, and so I'm here, and I'm so glad that I'm here in uh, early October in Amarillo. And uh, like, like he said, I'm married to the beautiful, uh, she was Delaney McKee, but I gave her my last name. She's Delaney Woodward now, and uh, I'm happy about that. We have, a, uh, we have a son. He's one years old. His name is Pistol, and he is a dog. Um, <laughs> but he's our son, and we love him. We love him dearly. Uh, it's like having a one-year-old. I mean, he likes to pee on things, and, and, <laughs> and yeah, we're working on it. Um, I thought I was going to have a really well-trained dog, and it just did not work out like I wanted. Hopefully, we do better with our real kids. Um, and so, uh, like, like Ronnie called me out on this, uh, you know, my, my being so small and my helmet being bigger than my body, I wanted to say something about Ronnie. Church, you need to know who he really is. Um, my dad, I have the, the benefit of, of having my dad who can tell me stories about Ronnie. Um, my dad tells this story about when they were little and they had this neighbor that they just gave the hardest time to. Like, he thought they were his friends, but he really wasn't their friends. They just liked to pick on him. Yeah, yeah. And so, 
one day, Ronnie and my dad, um, they get their neighbor boy, and they decide that they're going to hog tie him. And so they hog tie him up. He's sitting there bound in the yard, and my dad goes, Ronnie, we got to brand him. We need to brand, we need to brand him. And, I know, and, and this is what my dad claims. <laughs> this is what my dad claims, that he didn't really mean it. And so Ronnie, being the youngest, I understand that I'm the baby. I would just do what my brother said. Runs inside, gets a butter knife, turns the stove on, heats that thing up, just gets it just red hot, runs outside. And my, dad, my dad's like, you got the brand? And Ronnie just slaps it on his thigh. And my dad said it sizzled and smoked. And they branded their neighbor. He didn't come play with them anymore after that. And so uh, <laughs> this is your pastor. This is Pastor Ronnie Woodward. Yeah. Don't deny it. It's true. You can't, de- you can't lie in church, Ronnie. You can't lie in church. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. If, if you hadn't called me out, I wouldn't have called you out. Um, well, on that note, uh, let's pray real quick. And uh, let's just pray that, that God would speak to us today. I know that if we want to leave change, we want to leave better. That's up to us as individuals. God's here and he's ready to speak to you. Uh, he's ready to cause you to leave here more in love with who he is. That's the whole point. You're, you're here to learn, but you're here to learn more about Jesus so that you can love him more. And so let's just pray that we, we would be receptive. God, we love you. We're so grateful for this day that you have made, God. We're grateful that we woke up to new mercies th- this morning, uh, to your grace that was fresh and anew for us this morning, just like it is every single day. And we're grateful for that covering. God, give us the minds to perceive and the hearts to receive what you have for us today. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, amen. 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 Well, uh, there were, I mean, this, this is an interesting thought. I was thinking about this idea of toxic when Ronnie was, was saying, that, you know, this is the series that they're heading toward. And uh, it's interesting how there can be um, something that's really good for you. But how, how many of you know that too much of even a good thing can become a bad thing? You know that, right? Uh, for example, you're supposed to drink water. But there are people that have legitimately killed themselves or hurt themselves by drinking too much water. Uh, even this morning, my, my heel was hurting randomly. And so I asked Grandma for some Advil. And I took some. And, and as I'm taking them, I'm thinking, this is a good thing. It's going to help me. But even too much Advil could really hurt me. It could even kill me. And, and so with this idea of toxic, I wanted to kind of start it by, by saying that, that there's, there are things in this world, there are even things in the Bible that are God-given and God-approved, but too much of a good thing can sometimes become a bad thing, and it can become toxic in your life. Just like too much of a certain type of medicine is meant to help you, too much can become toxic for your body. And, and here's what, what I want to talk about today. It's this idea of happiness. Can everybody with a big smile on your face, can you just say happiness? Happiness, thank you. You guys smile beautifully. And so um, happiness, and, and I wanted to talk about this because I think it, happiness, is a, it's a biblical thing. Um, and, and I'll tell you like this. In the, in the New Testament, 49 different occasions, uh, the word blessed is used. Blessed or blessed, depending on like how you like to read the Bible. Blessed or blessed. And that word, it means blessed, but the other definition with it that's paired right next to it means happy. It's like when you read through the Beatitudes, you can read it as happy are the, happy are the meek, happy are the pure in heart. And, and so blessed means happy. You see that on 49 different occasions just in the New Testament. And so this idea of blessed, of blessed and happiness is actually a biblical principle. However, I feel like it's becoming relatively toxic based on I think a societal pressure. If you, are you hearing a lot of people in, in here in 2015 that tell you these kinds of things? Just do what makes you happy. Man, do whatever makes you happy. And so we've taken something that God has given us, this emotion of happiness when we feel elated. That's a great thing. It's good to feel happy. It's good to be happy. But we've allowed uh, a societal interpretation of happiness to seep into the church. And now it's even entered into many of our theologies where we have now gained this theology of happiness. And so we've taken a good thing and we've turned it into a bad thing where no longer is it, I'm going to pursue Jesus and through a pursuit of him, I don't even have to pursue happiness because I'm going to have Jesus. It's turned into, I'm going to pursue happiness and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at a God who I, I expect to bring me happiness. This is, this is what I want from God. God, bring me joy, bring me things, bring me happiness, everything that I need to be happy. So we've let it get into our theology. And so what I want to do, I've got, um, these are not my main points, we've got three very quick things about this 
theology of happiness. I just want to define it for you so you can identify uh, if maybe it's in your life or maybe you, uh, more, more likely, maybe the person sitting next to you, maybe it's them. Okay, so the theology of happiness, the first thing is, is it, it kind of goes like this. What makes me happy must be right. What makes me unhappy must be wrong. How many of you know that's not true? There's a lot of things I could go leave here right now and do that would make me happy that are very wrong and very opposed to the word of God. So that's not very true, but if we buy into this, this is how we begin to think, and it's very de- uh, detrimental. Number two is discomfort, delay, suffering, and inconvenience can't possibly be God's will. How many know suffering is sometimes a part of God's will? Um, delay. I mean, I'm 26 years old, and, and I grew up in this iPad, iPhone generation of we don't even know what delay is. Guys, we can order our Starbucks before we even get there now. And so delay, I'm like, how could delay possibly be God's will? Like, I, I'm impatient. I can't possibly wait. And if, if we're having to wait, it is the devil. You know, that's how most of us are beginning to think. The third thing, and this happens often without realizing it, we begin to worship the gods of money, comfort, pleasure, and things. The theology of happiness, is, this, is it you? Do you know somebody like this? Are you seeing this creep into our, our culture already has it? It hasn't crept into our culture. Our culture is inundated with this. But the sad reality is it's creeping its way into the church. Pastors are beginning to preach this theology. People are getting, beginning to buy into this theology. And God is becoming these kinds of things. And the, the problem, there's, there's obvious problems with it. Here's a couple real quick. A couple problems with this theology is it makes us think, number one, that God is there to serve us. That's a dangerous place to get to. What we've done at that point is we've taken the creator of the universe, God Almighty, and we've reduced him down to a vending machine. We say, all right, you know, if I, if I take something from a vending machine, I put a dollar in, I, I just came into contract with that vending machine, and it better pay up. Okay, I want my soda, and not only do I just get a, like, it'd be cool enough if you put a dollar in and soda just came raining out of that thing, but I get to pick what I want. So I put it in, that thing better pay up because that's, that, that was the contract. And we think sometimes that that's how God works. God, I gave in the offering. God, I did my Christian thing. God, I came to church. Now give me what I want. God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve God and to further his purpose and his kingdom all across this country, especially right here in Amarillo, Texas. This church has a purpose. This church has a mission. But if you think God is here to serve you, this church will never achieve that mission. We've got to humbly accept that we are just a piece in God's massive puzzle. We are just a part of his plan of redemption. And the second thing, the second problem, this this one's huge. Look, look, Look at this. If God's main priority for us is to be happy, then what happens when we're not? What happens when we're not? And it begins to take people down a pretty dangerous path of thinking, okay, if if I'm a Christian and I'm supposed to be happy and everything's supposed to work out really well, but what happens when I'm not happy? You know what it means? It means that God failed. Or it means that maybe God doesn't love me as much as the Bible says that he loves me. Maybe God's not watching like the Bible says that he's watching. Or it could even take you down a path of maybe God isn't even real. Because I tried that thing, and I wasn't happier as a result. And so do you see where this theology becomes dangerous? Where it's about things, it's about us doing what we want, getting what we want, being whoever we want. And so, does God want us to be like miserable, mopey Christians? No. I know some of them, I don't really hang out with them. And so, um, God, he, he wants us to be happy. He does. Like I said, 49 times in the New Testament, you see this idea of blessed are those, happy are those. And so it is a God-given thing. It is a God-given emotion that we have twisted into something that is wrong. It's become too much of a good thing, and it's become toxic in many of our lives. I kind of want to illustrate this point like this. Um, You know, as God as our our parent, God as our father. Um, I know for a lot of you that are parents, I know for my parents, that, that if you would ask somebody who has kids, tell me about some of the greatest moments of your life. Tell me about some of the happiest moments of your life. A good chunk of them are going to have to do with their kids. If, if it's in my family, I have two older brothers. Uh, a good portion of my parents' happiest memories would do with us, primarily me. But uh, it would have to do with us three brothers. They would say the happiest moments. I mean, when we got to watch them playing football, when uh, the day that they were born, the day that they took their first steps and said their first words. And if you're a parent, you can probably relate. And so parents, I mean, they're, they're, they're all about their children having great experiences. They're all about their children being happy. And so, but but let me paint a picture like this. So let's say uh, I am playing football and you know, the helmet's too big for my head or whatever, but I'm playing football 
And I score a touchdown. My mom and dad love football. Like, me and my brothers were coerced into playing football so my parents could watch more football. And so (laughs) I'm playing football. And let's say I go and I score a touchdown, which I did a couple of times, all right? I did a couple of times, believe it or not. And um, I, I'm, I'm ecstatic. I mean, I'm running around. I'm jumping up and down with my teammates. Um, you can't spike the ball in Albuquerque because they'll call a penalty on you. So I'm not doing that. But um, I look over to the stands, and my, my mom's going crazier than I am. I mean, my mom's, like, just, like, chest bumping people, high-fiving everybody, like, throwing. <laughs> she can spike the, the peanut m ms in her hand. I mean, she's going crazy. My dad's ec- ecstatic. They're excited. Okay, because I'm happy. I did something good. They're happy. We have a, pr- a parental relationship like that. And so, but, but think about this. Let's say I score that touchdown, and then all of a sudden, I, do, I spike the ball. I don't even care that I'm getting a penalty. I run to the other team's sideline, and I start throwing up some obscene gestures with my hands, and I'm, I'm jawing at the coach. I'm cussing at the players. I'm like, you know, just taunting everybody, and then I run back over to the sideline. If I were to look up, my mom and dad wouldn't still be like, yeah, go, Brandon. Like, you're awesome. You scored the touchdown. Because in that moment, my happiness is no longer my parents' main priority. Because I took something that made me happy. I took something that made them happy because I was happy. But I just turned it into the wrong thing. Because at that moment, their their priority is no longer, or my happiness is no longer their priority. My dad's going to come drag me off of that field. And so here's kind of the setup of the three points that I'll go through quickly today. But... There, God wants us happy, 49 times, God wants it, but I want to talk about the three instances, at least three, there's, there's probably more than this, but three instances where God doesn't want us to be happy, where frankly God doesn't care about our happiness, and I want to approach it this way because I think it reveals a lot to us as we look at our own lives, but number one, the first thought is this, God doesn't want you happy when it causes you to do something wrong or unwise. Number one, God does not want you happy when it causes you to do something wrong or unwise. Just like me scoring the touchdown, I'm happy, but if I go and I do the wrong thing, and I'm not playing with integrity, and I'm I'm not playing with character, suddenly my mom and dad don't care how many touchdowns I've scored because they're more worried about my character. They're more worried about my integrity, and and as, as Saul actually alluded to earlier just up here on this stage, he, he talked about 1 Peter 1, 5, where it says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. I think, I think a lot of people like to read that as just as he who called you is happy, so be happy in all that you do. Okay, that's our own personal version, but, but here's the truth. God is more concerned with your holiness than your happiness. God is more concerned with your holiness than your happiness. But a charge like that from 1 Peter saying, um, be holy. Just as he who created you is holy, be holy in all that you do. That doesn't mean you leave here and go try to be as holy as you possibly can because you will fail. We always fail when we go try to be as holy as we can. What do we do? We go pursue Christ. We pursue Jesus with everything that we are, and we receive his holiness. We take his grace, and that is how we can be holy as he is holy. So we we don't leave here and go attempt to do these things on our own. So God is more concerned with your holiness than your happiness, but do this by pursuing Jesus. I, I want to talk about, um, may, this may hit everybody, maybe this just hits um, more my age group, but do any of you guys like movies? you like going to movies? Yeah. All right, I love movies, okay. Um, what about like Netflix? Any of you guys watching Netflix at home all the time? Okay. You know what I'm blown away by? And so I run, I run the college young adult ministry in Albuquerque at Copper Point. And so I'm, I'm having conversations all the time with this age group. And just in a, in a circle of friends, somebody will throw out this movie that they just watched. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, funniest movie I've ever seen. And then I'm like on my phone later looking up that movie and it's rated R uh, for like a lot of reasons. Like a lot wrong with it. And, and I'm sitting there thinking for a moment. Why in the world, okay, so this is for the people in Albuquerque, probably not you guys in Amarillo, you're better than they are, okay, and so, but maybe, maybe you guys too. Isn't it interesting that we, we claim Christ, you know, I'm pursuing Jesus, I, I've been made new, I'm pursuing holiness and righteousness through my relationship with Jesus Christ, yet the type of movies that we're willing to go sit through, I mean, we will willingly get in our car, drive to a movie theater, get out of my car, go and purchase a ticket that costs like $96 now, and I will walk in and I will willingly sit in this theater and sit there for two hours to watch people engage in sin. Isn't that crazy? This is what we're dealing with in Albuquerque. And and I'm looking at people and I'm I'm trying to be like past, you know, not like super judgmental pastor and I'm trying to have these conversations with them. But, and it's the same thing with with Netflix, the things that we're watching at at our home where these TV shows are, 
you know, 22 episodes of 50-minute uh, shows. And so we're consuming this stuff at a high rate, higher than we ever have before. And I'm sitting there thinking, what are we doing this for? Are we doing this in the name of, of happiness? Because some of those comedies are funny, but they are filthy. So yes, it makes you happy for those two hours. Maybe it makes you happy as you engage in conversation with your friends after the fact. But God is not concerned about that happiness. He's concerned about you being holy. He'd rather you abstain. He'd rather you say, you know what? That looks hilarious, but I'm more concerned with my holiness. That looks funny, but I don't want my mind and heart to be filled with filth. And so begin to ask yourself, why am I doing those things? Am I doing it in pursuit of happiness? 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 talks about avoiding and fleeing sexual immorality like many of these movies and shows have. And in verse 7, it says, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. And again, that's in the context of run from, flee from sexual immorality, and many of us run right into it. I don't think it's okay, this stuff that we're watching. I don't think it's okay, a lot of this stuff that we're taking in through our eyes, the window of our soul. We've got to be careful. Also in the name of happiness, you know, doing the wrong thing, doing the unwise thing. I ran into a friend uh, maybe a couple years ago. And he had been married for a few years. I was at his wedding, and I mean, it was, it was a beautiful wedding. He stood on the stage, and he cried when he saw his bride walking down the aisle like everybody else is crying. It was magical. And so I run into him. I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. And I'm like, hey, man, how, how are things going? How's your wife? And he kind of just had this look on his face of just complete sadness. And, and I was like, what's going on? He said, well, we actually just recently got divorced. This is a young guy. He's 26. He's my age. And he's already been married and divorced at that age. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, what in the world happened? I'm, I remember, man, you were crying when she walked down the aisle. Like, it was obviously love, and you guys said all these amazing words to each other. What happened? And he, he said the response that many of you might already be ahead of me with, and he said, you know, well, we just weren't happy. And so they get out of a, a marriage, which is a state contract, but much bigger than that. Do you know that marriage is a three-way covenant between your spouse and God? Marriage is a big deal. A covenant is a promise that cannot and should not ever be broken. And I'm looking at him, and and I wasn't, I'm not his pastor, and I didn't do his wedding, and so I didn't probably say as much as I wanted to, but I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, didn't you guys say for better or for worse? I I know that it's worse right now, but you said it. You looked her in the eye and you said it. Didn't you, didn't you say for sickness and in health? Because because we we know that there will be healthy times, and we know that there will be times of sickness. And you've got to get through that. You've got to fight through it. Didn't you say for richer or, or for poorer? And, and the poorer typically comes when kids enter into, onto the scene, right? But di- didn't we say all of these things? In, and in that moment, I want you to catch this. All of this promise, this this knowing knowing that this is a covenant between his wife and God, all of that was trumped by the fact that he wasn't happy. Isn't that crazy? And that's what so many of us are doing. But you know what the craziest part was? He was more unhappy after he got out of that marriage than he was in it. The guy got miserable. I mean, he hit rock bottom. And just now, two years later, is he finally kind of climbing out of it. Don't leave it for the sake of happiness because it will leave you empty every single time. And that's when God doesn't necessarily care about our happiness. He's saying, look, I know that you feel like you'd be happier if you left it right now, but I'm more concerned with your holiness. I'm more concerned with you being a man or a woman that stands by your promise, that will stand in this covenant for better or for worse because you said it and you meant it. So stay with it. Don't leave just for this fading idea of happiness. And and just like this guy, when we pursue happiness at all costs, it may end up costing us everything. And that's what it did for this young 26-year-old man. I want to tell you this, pursue righteousness over happiness and get both. Pursue happiness over righteousness and get neither. I want both. So we pursue righteousness over happiness. The second thing, that God doesn't want you happy. Number two, God doesn't want you happy when it is only based on things of this world. I'm going to take a drink of water real fast. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. God does not want you happy when it's only based on things of this world. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start it like this. I am a, I'm a little bit of a mess when my wife leaves town, okay? She is a scheduled person. We go to bed on time when she's home. We're getting to bed at like 9.45 or 10. Uh, the house is in order. When she leaves town, like two days, I don't even know what happened. Like, things are everywhere. I'm, this happened to me recently. The house is messy. I'm just, like, I had forgotten to eat lunch that day. Like, I'm even forgetting to do things that normal human beings just do. And I'm, for, I'm leaving out meals. And um, 
And then I'm sitting there on my couch, and I'm watching TV, and I'm like, okay, it's 10, I should probably go to bed, but I'm like, I'm just going to keep watching. It ends up being 1.30 in the morning, and I'm still sitting there watching TV, and I'm watching cartoons, guys. I'm watching, I'm watching Hey Arnold, and I'm watching, like, Rugrats and things of that nature. I'm like, I don't, why, what am I doing here? I had this, like, moment, like, I need my wife back. She makes me so much better. <laughs> yes, she makes me a lot more mature. And so, as I'm, but as I'm sitting here watching TV late at night, as many of you have done, and commercials kind of go away at that point, and it turns into infomercials. Turns into, you know, there's not five commercials in a segment. It's just this one long infomercial. And in one sitting, I learned a lot about myself. Number one, I learned I'm not pretty enough. That's what they told me. And they said, you know what? Aging starts young. I know you're, you're, you're in your early 20s. Aging starts young. Buy this cream. We've uh, taken this thing out of this Caribbean fruit. You will be young forever. And so I'm like... I need, I need this cream for my face, and this is, this is how I'm staying young right now. I bought this cream. I, um, I learned that I'm, I, my muscles aren't big enough. That's another thing I learned. And so I've got to buy this ab roller that then can, like, flip open to a pull-up bar and then a push-up machine and then can fold up and fit in my back pocket. And <laughs> so I, I, need to, I need to buy this. Um, I learned that my house is not warm enough, that my house is freezing. I'm looking at it, it says, like, it's like 75 degrees in my house. I'm like, it's fine. He's like, no, your house is freezing. And so you need to buy this blanket that has holes in it that makes you look like a wizard. You, <laughs> you need it. And, and then I also learned that my waffles aren't even good enough. And I'm being for real. In one sitting, my waffles aren't even good enough. And you can't use a normal waffle maker. You need one that will make them in the shape of dinosaurs. And that way, life, and, and as, I'm, as I'm watching these, it, this wasn't happening, but as I prepared for this sermon, this moment kind of came flashing back to me where I'm sitting there in my house. And it's, it's a fine house, okay? It is our first house, but it's fine. Nothing's wrong with it. We've gotten to do a few things to it to make it, you know, our home and, and, and all these different things. And I'm sitting there. Life is just fine. But everything coming off of this TV is telling me that life is not okay, that you do not have what you need. You do not have enough of any of these things. You need more. And after you get more, then you will be happy. And you ever notice in these commercials that, like, as the person struggling to cut their tomato with this knife, that it's black and white. They can't even cut a tomato, and they're, like, crying, and it's black and white. And, like, okay. and then it's like, but if you buy these knives that cost $1,000, I mean, you can cut through tomatoes like nothing. And, and it's sparkly and colors. And, and, and as, as silly as that is, that's what this, our world and our culture is trying to paint a picture of for us, that when you don't have, it's black and white and nothing. But when you have all this stuff, I mean, then life is grand. Then life is glitter, and you can cut tomatoes like nobody's business. This is what you need in your life. And I was just so blown away by this that we buy into that. Literally and figuratively, we buy into this stuff thinking, I need more so that I can be happy. But God doesn't want us happy when it's tied up in things of this world. First John 2 15 through 17, Jesus talking, he says, do not, uh, actually this is uh, John talking, he says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I think where we buy all this stuff comes from that third one, the pride of life. It comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. I love this. And it's saying, and this is a warning for us, if you love the world, some of us, we're not quite there. You know, we like, you like nice shirts, things like that. That's, that doesn't mean you're living in sin. But it is a deep-rooted love for the world. And if we have that, then John was saying, then you don't have the love of the Father in you because he will not have people with divided hearts and divided interests. And it's like in Matthew 6 when Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. You know that word money? And I want you to look, look at how this is said. It doesn't say you can't uh, serve God and have money. It says you can't serve God and serve money. It's a big difference there. And that word money, let me take you uh, on this. I like to do word studies here and there. Like I don't speak Greek, Ronnie, but every now and again I'll throw this stuff out here. And so um, this, this, this word, um, let me back up because like I said, I don't speak Greek. So this word, it's a, it's a Greek word called mammon. Some of your translations say you can't serve both God and mammon, M-A-M-M-O-N. And I was thinking, mammon, I've never like said that before. Like, yeah, I'm just off to go make some mammon, you know. And so I'm like, what does this word mean? It's a Greek word, mammon, it means wealth, it means pleasure and, and a, a desire for those things. Mammon is actually rooted in a word from the Chaldean language, which is a much older uh, culture and language. And in Chaldean, this word meant confidence. Now I want you to catch where I'm going here. The word for wealth and money in Greek comes from a word that means confidence. 
What is Jesus getting at here? It's not that there's God and then money's evil. He's saying, you cannot serve God and say that my confidence is in God, but then be over here where in all reality your confidence is in money and things and pleasure. Isn't that crazy? Mammon and serving mammon and serving money, it's so much bigger than just I have $100, am, am I a Christian? No, it's does that money have you? Do the things you own own you or do you just own some things and it's okay if you don't have them anymore? And so that's what we have to begin to ask ourselves. You know, we think that our desire for the world is sometimes it pulls so hard, it pulls so strong. But I want you to look at what C.S. Lewis uh, once wrote. He said, our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. And he's talking about this idea of the, the pleasures of the world. He finds them not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. You know what picture he's painting here? A boy over here on the beach making sandcastles, and there's a cruise ship way out there. People are having a good time. This boy on, on the shore building sandcastles, making mud pies, is thinking, oh, man, like, that." his mindset is, that's the world. Because the world is gold, it's glitter, it's sparkly, it's in color, it's great, everyone's having a good time. I just want to be at that. And God's saying, that's such, a, and, and over here as he's making sandcastles, this is, this is following Jesus. You know, I'll just, I'll abstain from fun and life because this is what it, C.S. Lewis is saying it's completely opposite. People of this world are the ones in the sandbox. It's the people who are following Jesus who are on the cruise ship. It's bigger. It's better. God has more for you than you could even imagine or ever dream of or fathom in your life. I don't want anyone in here to think that holiness is the sandbox and the world is the cruise ship. He's saying holiness with Christ is the cruise ship. This is where the party's at. This is where the real fun is. This is where eternal treasure is laid up here. The world is the sandbox. People fooling around, thinking they have more than they really do. The third and final thing, God does not want you happy more than he wants you joyful. God does not want you happy more than he wants you joyful. The word happy means this. It means delighted, pleased, or glad as over a particular thing. As over a particular thing. I want you to catch this. We'll do one more quick little word study. Uh, happiness has a root word, hap. Can everybody say hap? It's just kind of fun to say. Okay. Root word hap. Hap means luck, chance, or accident. Do you know the word happenstance? Yeah, we just ran into each other by happenstance. It means complete accident. We didn't mean to do it. Happenstance and happy have the same root word of luck and chance, and I didn't mean for this to happen. You know what that means? You don't control your happiness. But the Bible says over and over again that you do control your joy. So joy is ultimately a greater, more enduring thing than happiness. Does that mean happiness is bad? No. Some of us are going to just be very happy today at some point, but your happiness should be rooted in joy. It should not be happiness that stands on its own. Here's why. Because happiness can be taken from you in a second. Think about it right now. Maybe you're here right now, and maybe you're happy. And we were walking out together, and we're both happy. Then we go out to your car, and while you were sitting in here happy, Somebody bashed in all of your windows and took everything of value out of your car. Happiness gone. Suddenly, we're not happy anymore. And if your happiness is not rooted in the joy of the Lord, I'm a little bit afraid of what you're about to do in that situation. I'm probably going to take a couple steps away. Like, I'm going to let you cool off and figure this out. But when we have joy, even our circumstances can't affect us like that because it cannot take your joy. It cannot steal your joy. And so don't, don't base your life on happenstance. Base your life on what Jesus says is unshakable. The Bible says that joy is unshakable, that it never goes away, the joy of the Lord. And so happiness can be taken from you in a moment. A bad diagnosis, a loss of a loved one, financial or relational turmoil or struggle, your happiness can be ripped from you in a moment. But your joy can never be stolen from you. John 16, 22, let me prove it to you. Jesus is talking to his disciples and this is right before he goes to the cross, and he knows that the hardest time of their life is ahead of them. So he says, so with you, now is your time of grief. You know, grief is the opposite of happy. Grief, grief and happy do not go on the same page together. He says, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. So he says, you're about to go into the hardest time of your life. You probably won't be happy 
but you can still maintain your joy throughout this season. And guess what? Somebody can take your happiness, but they cannot take your joy. You control your joy. It's a joy unshakable, and I love that. I want that to be my foundation that I walk on. When we're trying to walk with happiness, it's like walking on water. And guess what? We're not Jesus. We sink every time. If you tried walking on water, I tried it once. It didn't work out very well. And so walk on solid ground. Joy is the solid ground of our life that when everything feels like it's shaking, when everything is rattling, when everything is crumbling around you, you say, you know what? I still have this rock of Jesus Christ that I am standing on. That is my joy. That is where it is found, and no one can take it from me. You know what that means by no one? It means that no person, and it also means that Satan himself cannot take your joy. Just like with Job, Satan took everything from him, everything from him, except what? Joy. Job doesn't seem joyful throughout the whole thing, but he comes back to God, which shows me that joy was in there somewhere. You see, happiness is an eternal pursuit, while joy is an eternal peace. Happiness an eternal pursuit. Joy is an eternal peace. I'd rather have an eternal peace than live my life having to pursue something the rest of my life, like running after the pot of gold at the end, end of the rainbow. It's not there. You'll never reach it. You'll never attain it. John 15, 11, Jesus, this is just one chapter earlier, again, talking to his disciples in this moment of grief. He says, I have told you this so that my joy will be in you and that your joy will be made complete. He says, I tell you this so that my joy may be in you. Guys, we don't have to depend on, our, on ourselves to keep ourselves joyful, to keep ourselves going. We go after Jesus. He puts his joy in us, and we are made complete by him and that joy that he gives us. At that point, it's not about happy. It's about joy, which can never be shaken, can never be taken. You see, I love this. Joy is not based on what is happening around you, but is already happening. But what is already happening within you. What's, what's happening within you this morning? As we, as we begin to wrap up and close, um, what's happening within you? Because the, this, this passage says that Jesus, he wants his joy within you. You know, the Bible talks a lot of this idea that Jesus, he stands at the door of our heart and he knocks. We, we want to invite Christ into our lives. And, and you might be in here thinking, well, Brandon, I don't, have, I, I don't have that kind of joy. Well, maybe it's because, let's go back to the starting point. Do you have Jesus yet? Because when you have Jesus, he says, I want to fill you with my joy. And when I've filled you, with my spirit has filled you, and I've, spilled, and I've filled you with my joy, you will be made complete. You will not lack for anything. You will not want for anything. And so can I get every, every uh, head bowed, every eye closed? I just want to ask a couple of questions. And maybe you're in here and that's you and you're saying, Brandon, I don't have this joy, but I know that I don't have it because I don't have Jesus. I know there's others of you in here that you don't have it right now just because maybe you've lost focus a little bit. But let me talk to this first group real quick. This is every head bowed, every eye closed. But maybe you're in here and you're saying, Brandon, I don't have joy because I don't have Jesus. So I want to go back to square one. Say, Jesus, I need you. I want you to make me complete. I want you to take away any, any sin that I have, any shame that I have, any guilt that I have. The Bible says that there is no more shame. There is no more condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. I want you to be rid of your shame. And I want you to step into a life of joy and the promise of eternity with Jesus. And so with every head bowed, every eye closed, is there anybody in here that would, just for a moment, would like to lift a hand and say, Brandon, that's me. I want to know Jesus. I, I don't have him right now. And so I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want that joy. Is that anybody in here? Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. Is there, okay, let me ask another question. Is there, and this is for maybe the majority of people in here. Maybe you're here and you're saying, Brandon, I've had the wrong focus, and I have let the, the a cultural principle seep its way into my theology and it's become toxic because I am I'm chasing happiness I'm, I'm chasing relationships that are not God centered because I want to be happy I'm chasing money and things and I'm serving money and things and my confidence is in those because because I think they're going to make me happy and if that's you in here and again every head bowed every eye closed and you're saying I, I want to this is me today you were talking to me I need to make a change today would you would you be willing to raise a hand is that anybody in here amen thank you anybody else that was for you. Thank you. Well, I want to pray uh, for both groups, and then uh, we'll wrap up today. Remember, joy that comes from Jesus is unshakable. It cannot be taken from you. It cannot go away. Chase Jesus, pursue Jesus, and let your joy and happiness be found in that. God, we love you. 
Father, we're so grateful that we get to sit in here today and worship you freely. God, we're grateful for our freedom. I ask that we would never take that for granted. And God, we're grateful for your word. These, these words that were penned 2,000 years ago, uh, they're not dead, God, but they are alive. And they are speaking to us right here where we are today. And we're thankful that you've given us these minds to perceive and hearts to receive today. So God, help us to leave here more in love with Jesus. Help us to leave here more uh, ready to pursue him more, ready to pursue Jesus over happiness. And God, that our joy will be rooted in Jesus, that our happiness would be rooted in that joy. And so God, I pray for a spirit of joy that would come over every person in this room. God, I know that there is turmoil going on in here. I know there is sickness. I know there is hardship that is happening in here. And so God, just let your presence of peace and joy overtake this room. God, we pray your peace that surpasses understanding over everybody in here right now. Let our happiness and our joy come from our relationship with you, our promise of eternity with you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Yeah, give him a great big hand. God is incredible, isn't he? And I'm going to tell you, that was an incredible word. I knew the Holy Spirit would speak to you for just the right thing. I think that is the most awesome kickoff for this series that we're going to be doing. Uh, I'm trusting God for some miracles. Amen. I'm trusting God for something absolutely incredible. And when he spoke in this, it hit me square in the face today that I think a lot of times I'm just, man, people do things and I don't get happy. I'm that person that you want to step away from. Get a couple steps back. Uh, it's the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I'm, I'm ready for the glory of God to just, man, shine in me and do something incredible. Brandon and Delaney. Delaney, what is your title one more time at uh, where, what you do for work? Deputy Chief of Staff for the Mayor of Albuquerque. Literally, he's the mayor. She runs the show. <laughs> That's exactly how that is. That's exactly how it is. But um, she's got an incredible job that she does. I'm so very proud that you're in our family. Brandon, now this group that Brandon and Delaney are, are pastoring, uh, they just moved into the main auditorium. They outgrew their room. They're running, what did you have uh, Wednesday? Five, 500? Had 500 college students show up. And uh, that's normal. And that's a normal thing. They've got an incredible thing that they're doing. Thank you for taking time out. Thank you for driving over uh, and blessing us with this word. Uh, we're going to leave change today, aren't we? Hey, right now I'm going to give you an opportunity. We want to bless them, and I'm going to ask our ushers to come, and uh, we want to bless them and uh, send them out with an offering to, to help uh, with their expenses, driving in and speaking. And uh, this, is, this is what I think. I don't think this is your last time to be here. Uh, yeah, I want this to be your home, your home away from home, and we love it when Galen comes, we love it when Dustin comes, and uh, man, thank you for coming and bringing, and uh, bringing the word in such incredible, let's pray over this, and uh, let's pray over these guys, and uh, pray that God will just bless. Father, we're going to pray that, that uh, number one, thank you for Brandon and Delaney coming and just ministering to us today. Thank you for the love that we feel in the message that they spoke today. Thank you for your anointing that was upon this word that, uh, man, I don't have to pursue this joy, this thing that goes away, that I can pursue this, or this happiness that goes away, but I can pursue this joy that is just everlasting in my life. So, Father, we thank you for that. I'm going to pray today that, that I'm going to pray that we can bless them in an incredible way. Pray that you'll just bless each gift and giver, and we're going to give you all the praise and the glory. Amen. Amen. Okay, i got to do one last thing. I need you to come up here real quick. I need, oh, y'all go ahead and take up the offering. I need somebody with a good cell phone. Tana, somebody with a good cell phone. I, I need, well, hang on. I need somebody, come here. Yeah, just take a picture. I need, I need some selfies. I don't have my phone with me. So I got to get a selfie. Get a selfie. No, not a selfie. You're going to selfie me. This is a regular picture. Yeah, you're going to selfie me. You're, you're showing your age. Uh, yeah. Okay, don't go away. I need a picture. I need a picture. I don't need a selfie. Selfie's me doing this. Yes. <laughs> That's our photographer. Oh, I'm not done. I want Delaney up here. And then I want Shannon on the other. No, all of us. Yeah, I want Shannon on the other side. You got to quit playing the piano for a second, babe. Yoo-hoo, you. You got to quit playing the piano. 
Got to get another picture because I don't get this very often. So did you right here? Right, right. Isn't this a good looking? Is this not good looking? Sorry, I'm proud of my family. Where are you at, babe? Okay, there we go. Right there. <laughs> this is great. This is where are great. You looking? Where are we looking? I don't care where we're looking. We're just looking. Look somewhere. Hey, man. Oh, Tori's taking one more. She turned the camera the other way. One more. Hey, I'm proud of my family. I'm proud of my family. What an incredible legacy that mom and dad handed down. And, uh, man, I'm just so proud of you guys. Hey, yeah. Uh,